This is a moment when we follow Quincy Jones' admonishment of leaving one's ego at the door. One quality that was ingrained in my father from young was a certain indomitability. Born in June of 1932, he was the youngest of three sons. He contracted polio at a very tender age and made himself overcome his slender right leg with tree climbing, running, horseback riding, which some of you might have seen just now, and other various sports for most of his teens. It's also probably why he's left-handed. He also learned to walk and talk again after a nearly fatal car accident in 1963. However, the spinal problems plagued his back for the rest of his days. My papa saw Beijing history happen many times. The first was when he was five years old and the Bridgetown disturbances unfolded before his young eyes. He was taken to the city by his mother, my grandma, Alice Hearn, who was a Jamaican by birth, for shopping. And they were due to return home by one of the, the Rockland buses. For the younger members of the audience, those of the red and green buses that were open at one side, the benches were made of wood. The bus was packed with people. They, they all wanted to leave Bridgetown in a hurry. However, the driver was insisting on leaving by the clock. So my grandma took matters in her own hands, and I'm grateful for that because I might not be here right now. She took up her parasol and whacked the driver over the head. And uh, this was as a sea of people was milling over the bridge towards River Road. So the rest of the bus cheered on my grandmother. And my father, as a toddler, watched in awe how this little petite Jamaican got the driver to move ahead of schedule, and just in time. It was shortly thereafter, my grandfather took a promotion within Fogarty's department store and switched from Barbados to Trinidad. Papa went to primary school there with actor Jeffrey Holder at Queen's Royal College in Port of Spain. At 11, he went to Gordonston, the UK boarding school known for pupils like Prince Philip, Prince Charles, and Prince William. During his time spent there, at 14, on a dare, he appeared at parade drill with nothing but a swimsuit and boots in the middle of winter. He may have been punished, but trust me, he made a whopper in bets. He was later to know his own share of family life through me. I kept him on his toes. There was a time at three years old that I wanted to play records just like my daddy. So I took the lever off the arm, just like how he did. I took the needle by the handle, just like he did. The only thing that I didn't realize was that you needed a record first. <laughs> Can you imagine the ruckus? He didn't let me near his record player again until I was in my early 20s. And that was only <laughs> after he bought me a record player for my 21st birthday. Uh, he instilled a lot of, of reading habits in me, such as uh, Frank Herbert's Doom. Messiah, Children of Doom, which gave me a good uh, foreground for what is to happen today, to look at the years ahead, even before they unfold, and a certain level of insouciance from Leslie Charter's The Saint series. Preparation and a healthy respect for radio and audio equipment was second nature to Papa from his time spent at 6.10 a.m., which is now known as TTT. He was their first voice during the early to mid-50s. He was the first person to go from silver to golden network in two weeks. The desire for perfection eventually led over to Antenna. This was a fared column for the nation newspaper, where receptionists at radio stations read to see if they were reported for rudeness or sloppiness in answering the phone, while announcers' promotions were made or broken in his commentary. Desmond Bourne had a love for radio all of his life. He had an award-winning program called Jive Talking, which drew even fifth and sixth form pupils at secondary schools, even on the school night, to hear what new hits from the UK were now emerging, or why Duke Ellington was a crucial element of modern jazz, or examining the history of ancient Calypso on 78s. My dad would draw wide demographics, not only from tunes, but which agent personality he'd interview over what controversy or hot topic at that moment every Wednesday night in the late 70s. 
Now, can you imagine referring to the Anglican Archbishop of Barbados, Drexel Gomez, as sexy Drexy? <laughs> Only my dad would, and he got away with it. <laughs> Jai talking was what he enjoyed most, researching, calling West Indies Record Limited to see where the new music was coming from and why, and he would actually invite people over to his house and interview them in the living room and record the chat by his then state-of-the-art uh, Philip tape recorders, which is, which is a lot different from, from something like this nowadays. <laughs> Um, I, I, I'm glad to see that he, would, he actually embraced compactness because it, it brought to him the music he loved with just as much quality from the days that he actually saw the, the, the records being pressed. Now one of the groups that he interviewed for Jive Talking was a local band called The Brothers. One of the members who was not a brother among the brothers was keyboardist John Roy. He recalled my papa as the most amazing, amazing voice in the Caribbean. Who can forget when he did the emotional punctuation for the Greg Hoyas Associates jingle, which had Ray Armstrong and Tamara Marshall sing, Barbados, my home. Thanks, beer, our beer. <laughs> Many have tried, and I among them are not equal. Greg Hoyos, the CEO of Greg Hoyos Associates in Belleville, recalled this of my father. He was our Orson Wells, and we're the poorer for his loss. It is of interest to note how advertising and media also played a major part in my papa's life. While in the United States, he was a key role in securing Orson Welles himself to do an ad for Eastern Airlines for the popular ad agency Young and Rubicon. Well, he returned to Barbados in the late 70s and he first worked at Castani Williams, then he became creative director at Smith and Oxley, which later became Sojay Lonsdale. His ingenuity earned the attention of Barbados political arena he went on to create the ad campaign, The Great Combination, for the Barbados Labour Party in 1976, when Tom Adams swept seats that September from the right excellent Errol Bowen. After Tom's sweeping victory, which was the second time my father not only saw history, but actually made it happen, Pop himself was unceremoniously swept from his job at Smith and Oxley. He did not take it sitting down. <laughs> With the help of Elliot Motley QC, one of this country's top legal people, later Attorney General for Bermuda, President of the Court of Appeals for Belize, and also serving in the Courts of Appeal for both the Caymans as well as Turks and Caicos Islands, he won my father a wrongful dismissal suit. My father used this settlement as seed money for his independent agency, which handled clients such as The Nation Publishing, Chef at Restaurants, and home farm fruit juices. Strutting around in the shikis and Bermuda shorts, he cut quite a dashing and unusual figure like Santa on vacation. <laughs> Those of you who will know my dad best would remember how he loved to move around in his Vauxhall station wagon, which he originally leased, then bought outright from Smith & Oxley. The license number was MF639, which he bragged stood for Millennium Falcon, like Star Wars movie, and that he was a tropical hand solo. <laughs> now, it was not that Papa ever stood on convention. He acknowledged it where he felt it was expected, diplomats and royalty, but for the most part, <laughs> I watched how the guard was stunned when Mr. Adams calmly and dryly drawled over the income. Ah, uh, yes, that would be Desmond. <laughs> <laughs> My father's voice was one of the most distinguishing aspects of his personality. Jim Huber, while in CNN Sports, stated on air he got a call from Barbados from, quote, a guy who sounded like a cross between James Earl Jones and God. <laughs> he was correcting Huber on how to pronounce the locale where the 1988 Olympiad was held. Most folks, myself included, till, still tend to say so. But my father, he says, Seoul, as many Europeans do. Once this occurred, many Bajans who invested in CBC's cable TV service of STV, as it was then called, subscription television, 
knew it was Desmond Bourne who had called the Atlantis station. <laughs> <laughs> now, those of you who may have read fantasy author Neil Gaiman, you might recall that in one of his books he said, how parents embarrass us, intentionally or not. Now, when this CNN pronunciation lesson happened, I didn't know whether to blush or whether to grin. Long after he and CBC parted company, he still kept the phrase jive talking and used it as the fulcrum to develop an annual awards feature for the nation newspaper, jiving around with each particular year. The main section that folk would look out for is the 10 wind-up dolls of whatever year. His choices were daring, and his comments were caustic. In fact, at this time of year right now, if Papa was still with us, he'd be having ferocious arguments with both Harold and Roxanne about what could stay or what could go from jiving around. But my father also had a softer side. He created the clever and moving Santa's Progress, a radio series sponsored by United Insurance, where he tracked the mythical character that many say my dad, now me, tend to look like. <laughs> From the North Pole, till he was just in sight of Barbados. Perhaps this is why he chose to leave just before Christmas. Maybe he wanted to make an early advisement on behalf of the elves. <laughs> Desmond Bourne would have been 80 on June 11 next year. He called Kingsland Terrace his home since 1994. He and I were very alike and two strong personalities created more differences than alliances. Still, I both love and respect my dad, and I wished I mended more bridges with him, rather than finding holes and fences. So every child in here today who's lucky enough to have your parents with you, make sure that you do not let this last day of 2011 end without letting those parents know that you love them and their foibles, because it makes them unique from all the others. My papa, Never gave in to the lure of the internet. At the very end, he used only a typewriter and a fax machine to do his birthday research for the nation. The birthday section eventually uh, got retired earlier this year, but he had worked right up to that point. And it, I, it wasn't because he had to. It's because he wanted to. He loved it. He, he believed in, in wearing out rather than rusting out. Like Frank Sinatra, among the many favorites that my dad... <coughs> Uh, chose in his music for breath control and phrasing, my father definitely lived his way. Okay.